Welcome to Macro Pro and Friends, the 12 CEUs of Christmas. I'm Diane Cohen and I am joined by Wendy Stevens of Macro Pro. Wendy, how are you? Oh, I'm doing well, Diane. How are you today? I am great. Thank you so much for helping me conclude these 12 CEUs of Christmas. Um, we do have a question for everybody, but before we get to Wendy's question, I want to ask um, if you could put in the question box how many times you or how many different webinars you have participated in for the 12 CEUs of Christmas. So if you want to do that real quick, um, Wendy and I are going to do a little bit of housekeeping and then we're going to ask you the other question. Oh, somebody's been there all 12, 11, six, uh, five or six of them. Wow, wow, wow. There's a lot of people here doing, I think this is their fourth. So people have really been participating in this and that's great. So Wendy, I'm going to do some housekeeping and then you ask your question, all right? Hey, wait, I want to add one little thing to what you just asked about attendance. Also in the question box, if you could put anything that you'd like to hear about, any topic, any speaker, let us know because as Diane said, we're constantly looking for good ways to teach people and give them the CEUs and help provide that continuing education that they need. Perfect. Okay, so today's webinar is worth one CEU. You should, some of you will receive it within an hour. Others will, it may take three or four days um, because of the firewall. So please give it three or four days before reaching out to your IT department. Um, after you reach out to them, if they can't help you, please reach out to me. We do have handouts for today, so if you would like a copy of those, we can make sure that you get them. Just let us know if you would like to have them. And then if you have questions for our experts, you can put those questions in the question box um, after you finish the question that Wendy's gonna be asking you in just a minute. And then if you missed this or any other web, uh, any other webinar you are welcome to go to the macro pro youtube channel and watch them there of course you didn't miss this one but you might have missed a previous one so wendy let's ask them your holiday question this is a big question that i get from clients when i stop in to see them or when i talk to them on the phone okay even my mother asked me this morning she asked if i was finished with all of my christmas shopping and my answer to my mother was well of course mom i start in june and then she <laughs> commented that i continually hide my christmas presents and i lose them so i have to keep shopping which is true <laughs> i'll give her that then um in addition to that question, when I said, Mom, I'm finished with my Christmas shopping, she said, well, have you wrapped them yet? And guess what? I did. So I'm pretty happy. So my question to you is, how many of you have finished your Christmas shopping? And if you finished, how many of you have finished wrapping the presents? All right, let's see what people are saying. I see that there are a lot of people who have joined us for many of these webinars, which has been really fun to see, and we're really happy that you guys have been able to participate in them. Um, Emily says that she is still shopping. Uh, Laura says that she is finished, and they are wrapped. Look at Laura, Good you go, job, girl. Laura. And, oh, Jessica says not, she hasn't done anything yet as far as that's concerned. And Judy says all is done and wrapped. Hello, Diane. Hello, back to you. Yes, we'll make sure that you get a copy of the handouts. Um, and Mary Jane says that she is mostly done. Wow, so thank you guys very much for sharing that with us. And thank you, Wendy, for joining me for the last episode of the CEUs. I would like to bring on our um, experts now that are gonna be speaking to us about acute rehab, Chase and Jenny. Chase and Jenny, can you um, come on screen? Hi All right, there they are. Well, Chase and Jenny, if you would uh, be so kind as to tell our audience a little bit about yourself before you get started in your presentation. And we do wanna thank you so much for being with us. Of course, thank you for having us. I'm Jenny McDowell. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for San Joaquin Valley Rehab Hospital and Ballard Rehabilitation Hospital. We are part of the Vibra hospital system throughout the country. And I am Chase Taylor. I am the uh, Chief Executive Officer here at San Joaquin Valley Re Rehabilitation Hospital. 
And then I'll share also in the room, we have Megan Cleaver, who is a physical therapist, and she also is one of our lead therapists, and she's been with San Joaquin Valley for 25 years. So she's going to share a lot about uh, her injured worker experience. Okay, and we will get started here. When you have an injured worker that is leaving the hospital, the uh, STAC, as we call them, the short-term acute care hospital, you have a ton of choices on which uh, direction to go. And that is typically dictated by um, the, the particular needs of the patient. And so because of that, we receive a lot of questions. Oftentimes the first question that we have is, what is, uh, what is acute rehab? And uh, an acute rehab is a general acute care hospital. So unlike say a skilled nursing facility um, we're actually licensed as a general acute care hospital, the same as the hospital that if uh, some, if your injured worker uh, broke their arm and they go to the emergency department, uh, they go through their system, that's a general acute care hospital. So we actually maintain that level of care that you would receive on a typical medical surgical floor, uh, uh, or at least oftentimes we provide that level of care here but also we provide three hours of uh, inpatient rehab as well. So we provide those comprehend, comprehensive inpatient services uh, as, a, as, an, as an acute rehab. And, and I say we as uh, San Joaquin Valley, but I'm here to, to talk about all acute rehabs and just to provide education on what is an acute rehab as probably very few of, our, uh, of you are, are in our particular area. So that is what an acute rehab is that sort of the start of the conversation. Uh, an acute rehab often will have special designations like uh, they have stroke specialty services, uh, amputee specialty services, and those specialty services are uh, typically above and beyond what you can receive, certainly receive in home health, but also that you would, re that you would receive uh, from like skilled nursing, um, but will provide the type of rehabilitation services that you cannot get at the short-term acute care hospital that the injured worker would have presented to at the emergency department and, and throughout their stay. So once their stay is complete, they come to the inpatient rehab and, uh, and we take care of that uh, from, from there on until they're ready to move to the next step, which could be skilled nursing or home health or to discharge home. Um, Acute rehab hospitals also are joint commission accredited, typically are joint commission accredited. And uh, that is the same certification and accreditation that uh, also that acute care hospitals use. Um, we have in acute care, sorry, in inpatient rehab facilities or ERS uh, as, as we call them, either you, you will hear them uh, designated as an ERF, an inpatient rehab facility, or an ARU, an acute rehab unit, as some of those units can be within a hospital and some are freestanding. Uh, here we are freestanding. Um, some are within the hospital, certainly uh, many in our area are. And uh, the team that you, that you will have to take care of that injured worker, uh, we will have a physician. Oftentimes that's a, phys a physical medicine and re rehabilitation uh, specialty physician. They're, we call them PM&Rs. And the PM&Rs uh, take care of that patient or that injured worker, both from a uh, medical perspective, if there are anything, um, if there's anything medical that needs to, to happen with this uh, injured worker, and also uh, oversees all rehabilitation as well. Uh, nurses, you receive uh, nurses, physical therapists, occupational therapists, and speech therapists. So you have nursing and you have therapy, both of those worlds. Uh, along with the uh, medicine team take care of the patient. And then we have, uh, as all uh, earths do, uh, respiratory therapists. So another, another significant difference between the level of care that you receive in an inpatient rehab facility, as opposed to skilled nursing and home health, uh, or just to discharge them home, is that you receive uh, in, a, in an, an ERF, you receive 15 hours of licensed therapy uh, over seven days in a week. 
and that is dictated by CMS. So CMS tells us and all Earths that you have to provide 15 hours of licensed therapy for over over seven days a week, or you can't be qualified as an Earth any longer. Uh, and that affects our reimbursement. And it also uh, it also holds us to a certain level that we cannot dip under. We have a five to one uh, licensed nursing ratio. So what that means in the state of California, say it's skilled nursing, you might have 10 patients or even more taken care of by one uh, RN or LVN, uh, at an ERF you will have a five to one ratio, meaning uh, you have one nurse for every five patients and, and a CNA for about every seven or eight. Um, all of the nurses that are in most ERFs, um, ours included, are um, certified rehabilitation nurses. So this isn't, these are, these are career nurses that take care of rehabilitation patients and have that specialty training. And in some ERFs, and, and ours is this way, um, the, uh, the individual nurse is ACLS certified. So that's advanced cardiac life support. And that's something that isn't generally required, but often we will be ACLS certified to ensure the most, the highest level of, of patient safety that we can have. And if anything, if any one of those bad things that certainly can happen to you while you're at a hospital, as as uh, as as anything certainly could, uh, the nurses at an earth are more qualified to take care of those patients in those emergent situations than would be uh, certainly a, a a nurse in a home health situation or in a skilled nursing situation. Uh, uh, inpatient rehabs have a dedicated wound care uh, RN that's that's certified. Uh, in wound care and um, a designated infection prevention RN and a respiratory therapist, and then daily visits with PM&R uh, physicians that have pain management expertise. And that's not required, actually. What is required is that uh, your PM&R sees your uh, injured worker while they're inpatient over the 14 days or so on average that they are that that they're in inpatient, uh, that they see them once every three days. And some of those inpatient facilities uh, have it even even up to uh, every single day, which is our particular practice. The capabilities that you'll find in an inpatient rehab facility, uh, as as listed here. Uh, hemodialysis capable. So if there is a uh, an injured worker that is, is having a new hemodialysis that they didn't have prior to their injury or illness, uh, that can be taken care of in an inpatient rehab setting. So if you have any of those hemodialysis patients uh, or chronic hemodialysis patients, and certainly there are, there, are, there are many of those patients out there uh, in the community currently. If you have any of them, typically, that necessitates a trip from the skilled nursing facility or from home with home health to the uh, to the outpatient hemodialysis facility, whereas an ERF can do that all in-house. And this actually comes to the injured worker and it lets them uh, keep their three hours a day of, uh, of therapy that they have to have. Uh, for, for trait care and decannulation, oftentimes uh, if, if an injured worker or patient uh, comes to an inpatient rehab facility like ours, uh, they may have a tracheostomy. And if they were innovated for a long time in the ICU and had to have a trach, then uh, we actually provide that decannula decannulation. And that's something that generally a skilled nursing facility couldn't do, or uh, certainly not going home with home health, even though many of those patients are forced home with home health uh, and just skilled nursing, we actually have respiratory therapists here that are trained to take care of that patient to provide the best outcomes uh, to get these. And, and, and this is, this is I think, central to all of these points to, to get these workers back uh, home and to get them back working or to move to the next step as quickly as possible. Um, we, as very many uh, ERFs, have a, a transitional living room. So this is a living room. This is an area that's set up like a living room. What is it going to be like when this uh, when this patient goes home? What are the the activities of daily life that they have to do? How do they cook? 
How do they uh, use a spoon? How do they uh, get up and down off the couch? How do they how do they navigate their room? We actually have a living room where we can uh, where we can play through those things. Uh, patients that are that have critical Ill illness myopathies. Uh, these are long term, uh, typically long term uh, ICU stays or even short term ICU stays that have had uh, a lot of atrophy and a lot of uh, you know medical fragility. Uh, secondary to that, uh, we help get those patients back on their feet or to have them operate at their highest level possible. Uh, the same with CHF exacerbation uh, with patients and injured workers that have uh, wound care, especially deglovings, uh, is very difficult to take care of in other settings. We take care of those. And uh, having a, a wound care nurse is central to that. That is, that is a very much a central tenet to uh, us, uh, to our patient care. The expectations of the patient that come to an inpatient rehab uh, primarily is that they're able to actually do three hours of, of rehabilitation per day. And that can be a difficult ask. Um, yeah, certainly, I've spelled out some some of the worst scenarios in hemodialysis and and critical illness myopathies and CHF exacerbations. But these are oftentimes are patients that have some fairly basic ortho injuries. That the the best way to get them here is to, or the best way to get them back back to where they uh, where they should be is to have that three hours a day. So if they can have three hours a day of of um, therapy, then that's that's really the first question that we ask. If that's a yes, then we can uh, then we can see if we can get them in after that. But but that's the first question. And our average length of stay is somewhere between 12 and 14 days. It it sort of uh, vacillates just between that number. Um, and that's that's what you can expect. How long you can expect for your injured worker to be here? So uh, who could benefit from an ERF? You know, I, I, I had three questions or, or three, um, three different types of injured workers that could, that could come in here. Who could benefit from an ERF? Stroke and uh, CVA patients, uh, cerebral vascular accident patients, uh, brain injuries, whether it be traumatic or non-traumatic brain injury patients. And that could be from even uh, an injured worker that uh, had a cardiac arrest in the field. And, was taken to a hospital and has an anoxic brain injury. We see, certainly we see those uh, status post ICU stays. Spinal cord injuries, both traumatic and non-traumatic, that would be uh, that something happened to uh, the, the injured worker or the patient and or uh, a surgical injury as well. Uh, patients that have Guillain-Barre, any other neuro, exacerbated diagnosis. So that would be neurosurgery patients uh, with residual deficits, uh, West Nile patients. We actually have seen a, a, a significant uptick in West Nile patients this year uh, in the Central Valley. Uh, patients with Parkinson's, um, muscular dystrophy, MS, ALS, et cetera, and then the anoxias that I had discussed previously. And amputations. Uh, amputations are particularly Traumatic. These are these are difficult to deal with, and and I think for 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 people that don't typically work with amputation patients, it's much much more goes into this than what anybody would ever expect. And here in just a moment, I'm going to have uh, uh, Megan discuss that a little as well. Patients with multiple fractures from the hip and pelvis, uh, multi-system traumas, knee or hip replacements, arthritis exacerbations. Med to bill patients, so patients that have CHF, COPD, um, and that have had open heart surgery, cabbage surgery, uh, and then prolonged hospitalizations, myopathies, and burns. And this is what's known as the CMS 13. So CMS, and, and, and so CMS is the governing body uh, or, or governing agency over uh, an inpatient rehab facility that designates that we can be an inpatient rehab. They say, if you have one of these 13, we will send our Medicare patients to you. And what we can do with uh, injured workers is a little out. We can get a little outside this. It doesn't necessarily have to be in this, but, but anything within this 13 
uh, certainly do qualify. All right, we're going to kick it over to Megan. Hi, my name is Megan Cleaver. I'm a physical therapist here, and um, I'm going to speak about some more specific examples of what we do in um, physical therapy as well as occupational therapy and speech therapy involved in some of these injuries specifically to um, the workers. When we um, do our initial evaluations with a patient, when we know it's an injury that happened on the job, we are really always gearing towards what did you do for a living? What are your goals? How can we get you back to that if at all possible? So when we're looking even at the very acute phases, we are looking at always driving towards return to work um, as the patient's ultimate goal. So they're, we're looking at their skills. We're looking at first, of course, their very basic um, activities of daily living. We do a lot of family training and caregiver training to really make sure that they are the safest that they can be before they go to the next level of care, whether that is home or to a um, different level of care. So the first thing, of course, is looking at their medical stability. And obviously our nurses, our rehab nurses, as far as, and our physicians, of course, are looking at the overall big picture of how stable are they and how can we intervene in their ther therapeutic activities. The goals for each of these patients are really looking at the um, return to work, but also first returning to home, looking at their strategies and how are they going to navigate around in their home. The first diagnosis that I'd like to talk about is amputees. We see patients that have upper extremity amputees as well as lower extremity amputees. So um, depending on whether you're talking about upper or lower, the majority of our patients in acute rehab are going to be the lower extremity amputees. So phase one amputee would be a very acute recent amputee. So we're looking in phase one at first wound care of course, of the amputated limb, the residual limb. Uh, how are we going to already start shaping that residual limb so that it can accept a prosthesis as the ultimate goal to get that patient up on their feet again, to get them back to work? Um, we look at it from a physical therapy and an occupational therapy standpoint. How are they going to do their basic ADLs? How are they going to get in and out of bed, transfer wheelchair skills and walking? Um, we are looking at a lot of durable medical equipment. What are they going to need to be the most successful and safe at home? And preventing falls. That is huge when your brain still thinks that you have two legs and you get up in the middle of the night and you do literally forget that you have a recent amputee. So then um, we do see falls. So always preventing falls and further injury is a huge part of our goals. Another thing that we look at is phantom limb pain. So we're constantly from the very beginning preventing that, trying to cut it off at the pass and realize that phantom limb pain can become a very big issue for some people. Phase two will be the injured workers that now have had their amputation, they've done their acute rehab, they are successful at home, and now they're working with the prosthetists in the community to have a lower extremity or an upper extremity prosthesis built. Once they get that prosthesis built and fitted, then we can qualify them to come back to acute rehab to really focus on getting up on those new legs or working with their upper extremity prosthesis for their basic ADLs, once again. Um, we do a lot of prosthetic training we consult a lot with the prosthetist to fine tune that um, prosthetic leg. A lot of stretching of all of the hip musculature, the knee musculature, if they have a knee, all of the preventative things that we did during phase one, now we're carrying it through into phase two to really work on um, them being as successful as they can up on their prosthesis. Um, I, we recently had in, an injured uh, gal that had a 
a um, prosthetic leg built as an above knee prosthetic leg. So she did not have her knee. She had a very short residual limb. And so it was a um, quite a complicated prosthesis that she had built uh, very young. We were really gearing her towards what does she do for a living? Okay, she has to be up on her feet. She has to carry objects. So when she first came to us, the first day or two was in the parallel bars, really trying to get her standing pre gate and then doing some walking and then really quickly phasing her into first she needed a walker, then she could do the forearm crutches and then eventually getting her onto a cane so then she can carry something while she's walking. So really we're just once again gearing towards how can we make them as functional as possible now with the prosthesis on. The occupational therapist working on how is she going to be able to go to the bathroom and, and have her underwear up and down with that very short residual limb and the very short prosthesis uh, socket that she had on. So that's a, another really successful um, recent story that we've had. We worked with her on stairs with her prosthetic leg. We worked with her on getting down on the floor and back up again. So there's a lot that we can do once they have that prosthesis built and ready to go. The next diagnosis would be spinal cord injuries. And um, obviously a spinal cord injury is frequently a very um, debilitating injury and very life-changing. So when we work with these injured workers, we are really looking at what is their basic ADL level? What can we get them to accomplish while they're with us to make them as safe and functional as possible in the home, but still once again, gearing towards what did they do for a living and how can we possibly give them the right tools to get back to work? So we did recently have a spinal cord injured person uh, who was at the C5 level. So he really um, had some biceps, did not have triceps, did not have a whole lot of wrist extension, so it was really working with a lot of adaptive equipment with him. He um, needed to be a supervisor on the floor in a big factory. So when he eventually gets a powered wheelchair, he can actually maneuver around and get back to his supervisory role. And we even discussed a lot of options for him down the road with being able to do payroll on his computer, um, adapting the computer. There's uh, so much technology out there for spinal cord injury. So we are getting them to the basic level to get home, but also in projection of how we can ultimately get them back to work. Traumatic brain injuries is another big one we see in the workers. Um, most of the time we qualify people for acute rehab if they're at a Rancho level six and above. Um, the Rancho levels are a cognitive functional scale. Uh, Rancho six means that they are confused, appropriate, and they require mod assist with their cognition. Um, so therefore they can actually retain information a lot better than a Rancho 5 or a Rancho 4. A Rancho 4 is going to be that agitated combative stage um, and a Rancho 5 is moving out of that, but a Rancho 5 still is not able to retain information. So when you really look at the learning that has to take place and the progression within the rehab setting, it's ideal to have them at a Rancho 6. That being said, we have had Rancho 4s and 5s, and um, that's okay because the traumatic brain injury is not linear. It is definitely um, dependent on the situation, oftentimes with the patient, and dependent on the team and how skilled the team is working with these Rancho 4, 5s, and 6s. Obviously, we re rely heavily on our speech, language, and pathologists when we are working with these TBIs. Uh, they give the entire team strategies and um, a lot, and the family, a lot of education on how to best manage their TBI, especially when it comes to behaviors and cognition. And once again, what did they do for a living and how can we get them back to that? So much more than physical functioning, but really how can we, as their brain heals, how can we tap into their highest potential? cognitively. And then we've got orthopedic fractures. So with the ortho fractures, um, it depends on what was fractured, of course, what bones, 
arms versus legs, spines. Um, what are the uh, physical dysfunctions directly related to the fractures? With orthopedic fractures, it's based on time. The bones will heal most of the time. Um, and obviously they always give a, around six weeks of bone regrowth and healing. That can vary person to person. But for us, how do we, within that six week time and, and obviously earlier than six weeks, how do we get them to compensate in order for them to heal? So if they have a weight bearing restriction, we have to um, really look at how can they compensate to move around in their home while they're healing with the other leg, getting on the other leg. Um, if they have bilateral lower extremity fractures, which we have seen plenty of times, um, then we have to look at wheelchair level in the home and really getting them to a level of being able to be safe, but also to heal. And then if there are other things in addition to the orthopedic fractures, obviously it's usually not straightforward and we are also treating um, all of the things that would prevent them from going back to work. The next thing we talk about is degloving and wound care. Um, we did recently see a, an injured worker that had a degloving injury. All of the skin was gone on her lower leg from the knee down and we've had workers with external fixators on, um, all different kinds of things going on due to their injuries. So we are really looking obviously at healing and wound care um, as we are also looking on compensating for that injured body part and how do we work around that safely while it's healing and protecting it so it doesn't continue to get injured. And that would be it on my injuries. <laughs> Don't go far because I'm going to be questioning. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. Mm -hmm. All right. So how to get an injured worker into an ERF? The injured worker typically will end up at a trauma center or an acute care hospital. The acute care hospital, hospital, the case manager at times, they, when we talk to them about where do you send work comp injuries, who, who handles those for you? Uh, they say the, the nurse case manager or the adjuster does it, and that, that may be true, but a lot of times when I talk to the nurse case manager or the adjuster, they say the hospital makes that decision. So there are times where uh, everyone else is hoping the other will, will help out and, and fix that for them. There are definitely levels of care that they can go to. There are LTACs, ERFs like ours, skilled nursing, and then home with home health services. Uh, part of the, the team in each hospital of an ERF, there is physicians. We have discharge planners as well that will work with you on the injured worker getting to the next location in their progression for their recovery. Um, our team has a clinical liaison. So each ERF will have a liaison that is part of the ERF, but they're assigned to either the trauma center or the surgical center and they work with them. They make sure that we have, uh, the RFA has been sent in to you for approval. They make sure that we are in the NPN, that we're part of that network. Um, and then we, we look for the billing piece and I'll go into a little bit of that, but there's a full team around the injured worker that works between the ERF and the STAC for that transition. So it's smoother. We have um, within our hospital, because we are a general acute care, but we are an inpatient rehab hospital, we're the only level of care that a physician must approve the injured worker to come into the setting. So our liaison does work with our PM and R, goes through the, the clinicals of that patient, make sure that we're prepared. If it is DME for something that Megan's team's gonna need, do we have that? Is it, are they on a um, peg tube feeding at this time? Um, is the, the wound supplies here. So, so they're making sure that transition is smooth from STAC to ERF. Um, also, we are making sure compensability has been met. Have you all decided that this is an approved work comp injury that you all will cover? So we just, we put it all together quickly as possible and we will go through that. It, it can take an hour to two hours. That's about it. Uh, as soon as the referral is sent from the STAC, 
and we can review clinically and we make sure we have our ducks in a row, if you will, then we can take that on and work with that injured worker from there. Sorry, can you advance the slide or I can do it. I forgot to do that part. <laughs> One more? Yeah, so I went over that. Okay, great. So reducing the cost. Now, Megan went over catastrophic claims, but there are also the non-cat cases that we can help. We've had injured workers come to us that um, they did have an ankle fracture. That doesn't feel catastrophic, but they lived on a second floor uh, unit in their, in their um, apartment building. So there was no elevator to be up there. So we were able to get them in a very short period of time, strong enough to make that a successful home stay for them. Um, we do help reduce the cost. Chase had talked about us versus skilled nursing. The cost, we're, we're general acute, so we're going to cost a little bit more than a, a skilled nursing facility setting would be, but we typically keep the patients much, uh, much lower days inside our setting. So if you extend, <laughs> accentuate the cost over the 30 plus days because of the therapy isn't as strong and as skilled nursing, we're able to do that in a shorter period of time and saving, hopefully saving that cost back to you. We also avoid readmissions. There are times where the um, injured worker or the family wrap their arms around them and they say, we got this person that we're gonna take care of them at home. We, can, we have the, the team at home to do this. And that may not always be ideal when, once they, the reality hits and they are at home. So we can support um, if they come to us first, avoiding that, that ER visit and the readmission back to the hospital setting. Also with our post-acute partners um, and just all of the clinical team that we have around it, ideally that patient won't be returning to the, um, the ED for any issues. You can advance this slide. Okay, so a lot of challenges, you all know this probably better than I do. There's family dynamics. Uh, we do have social workers and case managers that work uh, with the families on the next step when they are to leave us. We have experience working with the attorneys. Obviously, adjusters um, aren't typically clinical. If, if you have that person on your staff, they're probably a nurse case manager. So we're able to explain that piece of it. Um, and can go over the, I, I'm not clinical myself, that's why I have my team that's clinical. So um, it's, it's nice to be able to, I can talk to the adjuster, work with them on uh, the billing piece of it, and then um, the nurse case manager, I can connect them with our clinicians when the injured worker is in-house for all those clinical follow-ups. Um, one piece that does throw off when we do get the referral for an injured worker is they, uh, we are not part of a fee schedule. The LTAX, that's a respiratory, long-term acute care respiratory hospital, IRFs, inpatient rehabs, skilled nursing also, there is no fee schedule in California for our setting. So when I'm working with an injured, work, injured worker and an adjuster, their typical response is we pay the California fee schedule. So here's your off, you know, bring the patient in. And there's that last step that we have to work on as far as either doing a single case agreement or finding one of our contracts that work with this claim right now. We um, have done our due diligence in putting our buildings into the MPNs in California. That's a, that's a clerical piece, but it is important. We wanna make sure that we're in network and we're, um, approved to be a, a caregiver for your injured worker. There can be delays in transfer because of the, the just the paperwork part of it. And I know I've got four pending right now where we, we need to get them out before they're in there for Christmas, sitting at that STAC. So it, there's just making sure that we can um, get that no, no fee schedule piece figured out. Also, we work with outpatient surgery centers. So if we can get the RFA approved and get that billing piece fixed before the surgery, then that patient is good to go after that surgery and they can come in straight from the surgery center. They, they typically stay about four days tops uh, after like a fusion or something like that. But again, their home setting wasn't appropriate for them to return right away. Um, we've gone in network status. We have work comp specialists on site. And um, we, we do an extensive marketing effort so that the hospitals understand we can support that. Again, the hospitals think you all do the decision-making. And so we wanna make that 
um, easier for you if we can to make sure that they understand we are the setting for an injured worker. When um, skilled nursing facilities, they just don't understand the billing piece of it. They've probably gotten burned because they just accepted a patient uh, and they didn't understand it. And so they, they say, no, no, we don't take work comp. So if you have those facilities, um, I understand they just don't, they don't get it. It can be complicated. And so when you have a, an earth that, that understands it and can at least give you some guidance, we'd love to help. All right. So again, acute rehab versus SNF. Physicians are gonna round daily on your patient in an acute rehab. So there's gonna be some medical needs for them alongside of the rehab piece. In a skilled nursing facility, they may see them once a month. And uh, the, the rehab tends to be, it can be about five hours a week versus the three hours a day with us spanning over 15 hours for seven days a week. When you're talking a catastrophic injury, Chase was talking about how they do have to qualify for that three hours a day, but because it truly is 15 hours throughout the week, we're able to expand it. And we're not talking three hours on a treadmill. <laughs> it, it can definitely start bedside and um, doing all the things that Megan and her team do, um, can always do kind of work in for qualifying for that uh, 15 hours. Also, we've got the nursing, the 24 hour, um, obviously rehab nursing, five to one ratio in a nursing setting. It's the 10 to one, it's, I've seen it 13 to one. It just, it really depends on their CNA and, and um, LVN piece of it as well. But the interdisciplinary team is key here with the physicians, the, the nurses that are specialized, um, and then our true, when, once the patient is ready to leave, our social workers and case managers that are helping them transition with you and your support and making sure that they have their DME, their, their any home services, or if they're going to outpatient therapy then to extend their progress from there. This is where we're getting close to our 55 minutes, but um, we wanted to see if this was time, Diane, for truly really understanding what cases you all see and what questions you would have for us. Okay, right now I don't see any questions for you guys. If you have anything else you'd like to add, we can see if somebody's gonna write a question in and give them a minute to do so. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, truly one of the things that I talk about is how to save you money. Now, if you are, do you have an injured worker that went to the ED because of a fall and it's a uh, fracture, a lower limb fracture, they do not have to stay in that hospital for three midnights to qualify to go to a nursing home or a skilled nursing facility. They can come directly even from the ED. We can direct patients. So let's say you have an injured worker. I, I had one where, um, unfortunately, they were being, um, uh, they were being, watched by an investigator because of the non-compliance that they weren't showing up to their appointments but they were still off work for quite a bit of time and there was a wound vac involved and the patient unfortunately um, was dragging his wound vac in the video to the liquor store <laughs> and back and the the adjuster called me and said i need a bed we need to get this guy in this wound is going to get worse this is going to be a problem so we were able to take him from the home setting bring him in get that wound, get the therapy on him, and then get him healthier to return to. People are allowed to live any way they want to live, uh, but we were able to get them home in that setting uh, quickly, but, but to make sure that wound was taken care of and, and cared for. So we can direct admit from, we've, we've gotten calls from doctor's offices. They'll call us and say, look, I just saw this injured worker. This is what's going on with them. Um, we could we could have an issue with this if they there's going to be a fall coming up there's going to be the wound is going to get worse um, things like that where they're just unsteady and not safe in that environment so again we're able to to bring them from that setting in home or from a doctor's office if you do have a patient in a lower level of care like a skilled nursing we can also transition them from there to us as well so there isn't a lot of rules as far as where we can bring folks in. There's not a lot of rules as far as how, how long they have to be in an STAC to come to us. It truly is. If there's somebody who can benefit from rehab, that's probably somebody we should look at. 
So we can take patients on the weekends. We can do it same day. Uh, and, and again, that these are folks that it's not a chronically ill geriatric person. This is somebody who went to work and bam, life's changed. And we understand that that's, that's a different lifestyle. This isn't just somebody who, who knew that they were kind of declining with, with whatever issues they had with their health. So we can get them in quickly, work with their uh, family so that they understand this is what's going on. We have visitation, um, eight, usually 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. We love when families wanna come in for family training. That's, that's very important as well. Um, so as many, many folks that we can get the, to have the, um, around the injured worker is ideal. It so, really takes um, the village. Yes, exactly. To, you know, help somebody <laughs> heal and become a recovering injured worker, right? Um, and I think that's the way we always want to think of them as somebody that's recovering and hopefully we can get them back to 100%. Well, you guys did an excellent job. You covered a lot of information. Um, your, your, your information was really detailed and I really appreciate that. You know, just even thinking about the amputees that um, you were speaking about and how you don't think about it, right? You just get up to go to the restroom because that's what you're gonna do. Right? And you forget that you don't have a leg. I, I just can't even imagine what that's like and the amount of pain the person goes through over and over and over again until you know their brain finally understands that they have to have a prosthetic or the leg's not there and they need to move differently. So thank you for bringing up all those issues and the things for us to remember. We wanna thank you again for finishing out our 12 CEU Christmas and we truly appreciate you being part of it. Until the next time, this will this particular presentation will be on the Macro Pro YouTube channel uh, by next Tuesday. So be sure to check that out if you would like to see the presentation again and get some information. Until the next time, bye-bye, everybody, and happy holidays. Thank you.